back to another episode of The Jump Show, looking ahead to the Cheltenham November meeting. A fantastic time of the year. Obviously, the Cheltenham October meeting was just a little bit of an aperitif coming on to this month and this week's action. Obviously, you can probably see by now, not Tom Bull in the hot seat this time round. Tom is away working with Racing TV. And I think the guys probably thought to themselves, we need to find ourselves somebody good here. We need to find ourselves somebody maybe within the Let's Talk Racing podcast, somebody that's you know a fantastic presenter, a pioneer of racing Twitter. And then they realized <laughs> that Josh was also working. So therefore, I've landed in the hot seat for this week. Where I'm very happy to be, be here. Jake, first of all, with yourself, how are you? And surely getting back to Presbury Park this weekend is top of the agenda. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I cannot wait. We've got the Airbnb booked, but they're all three days. Just absolutely bring it on. Absolutely buzzing. And Dan, I, I see that your preparation has gone so well that you've actually made yourself feel ill before the meeting, mm. which is tactical, because it can <laughs> only go up from here. Well, I was already preparing for the Monday afterwards to be a rough day, but I generally don't know how I'm going to survive the weekend of all of this going on. I'm currently nursing some Jakeman sweets uh, to get me through this show. There's a Lucas aid on hand just to power me through. I am not in top form. Probably won't be in top form for a good week and a half after this weekend, but the November meeting is something special. It's not as big as the festival in terms of the number of people there, but a lot of the right faces are there. It always promises to be a really good few days. Hey, this reminds me of the Wednesday of March last year where people were coming up to you saying, Dan, I really love your work, and you physically couldn't speak. I feel that's <laughs> a similar situation will happen. My body just shuts down around Cheltenham meeting times. <laughs> like, I, Even if I don't, I don't have to be there, and it just says, not today. You should not be <laughs> in Cheltenham. <laughs> and I'm still there, just shutting down as we speak. Yeah, so it's yeah. just not right. Yeah, very much so. Seems to be the world against yourselves. But hopefully you guys do enjoy this video. Uh, if you do, please obviously hit the like button and subscribe to the lads. Uh, they've been absolutely superb. Usually the first thing I watch on a Thursday or Friday morning, I must confess, I'm that type of person. But uh, let's, fingers crossed, get a, a fair few likes. I think we should set a target of 100 likes for this video. Let's ham it out of the park here for a Cheltenham November meeting. And fingers crossed, between the two lads, they'll get you a few winners and I'll steer you in the way of some absolute no hopers. <laughs> we'll move on to the uh, most notable recent performance that usually what you guys do first of all on the show. Jake, I'm going to come to you first. Over the last week, plenty of really good racing to get stuck into. Who took your eye? Yeah, and I'm going to be going for one that uh, you could say was just having a nice little spin around. And that's I Care Allen in the attempt qualifier at Aintree on Saturday. Um, I just thought it was an absolutely perfect qualification ride. Uh, John Joe had him out the back. He travelled into the race looking like he'd even win it. Um, but he just, yeah, rode on into third. Brilliant run. Go watch it back if you haven't already. Qualifies for the attempt final off mark of 142. And it's a Willie Mullins plot job. You don't really see them very often, do you? Um, you know, we're normally used to Gordon Elliott having one this far out. Uh, Willie Mullins has got one this far out and, and I'm a big fan of Ike at Rutland as I've as it's been well documented on this show so yeah he'll be for me already yeah like are we going to be here in five years time and you're going to be putting him up for a veterans chase <laughs> what's the story uh you never know we'll see how, we'll see how he jumps the fence but let's get the attempts over and done with very He's good still running in the coral cup oh the coral <laughs> cup sorry yeah it'll be, it'll be one of the two it'll be the wrong one it will be one of the two <laughs> He's still running Dan, in that race from last year. Yeah, so Jake was grinning like a Cheshire cat when his uh, horse was running. I was head in hands in absolute distress because uh, <laughs> my one's Foxy Girl. Um, I've watched the race back multiple times. I'm still angry. So I partly understand the ride. He, she was hooded first time out as far in the back as is humanly possible on the inside in a slowly run two mile handicap where the winner was basically prominent throughout. And I think you always know something's gone drastically wrong when you're held up on the inside and you're the fastest finishing horse four wide. Uh, and that's basically what happened there. She's gone up two pounds for it to one, two, five. I still think that underplays her ability. She will win one of these handicaps. I will back her when she wins one of these handicaps. If it's the last thing I do, please, God, just let her be given a bit more of a chance next time out. Well, it's glad that you're not still holding a grudge the Wednesday after the mm -hmm. race happened on the Saturday. I'm unwell. I'm still mourning that and Ned Tanner. It's it's just it's been a tough few days. Yeah. <laughs> it really has. 
It's been a bad news few days, I must confess. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, for myself, uh, I was at Gorn actually on Saturday. Uh, horse that won, one of the maiden hurdles, a horse called Beckett Rock, really took my eye. Uh, he was running against a few horses that had okay form in the book. I know, having travelled kind of to the races with the Nolan Yard, that they really fancied cut the rope. And he, I think he had him beat, to be honest, at the last, uh, even though it might have been tighter than than what people thought. And Joy of Vivo was a decent enough third in a punchdown festival bumper. He was well back in third. I just thought this was a pretty smart performance by a horse that probably has taken them by surprise. I think Henry de Bromed said uh, the day after at Nace that he told the owner if he was in the first four, it would have been a good result. So the fact that he's won on the bridle would indicate he's probably a little bit better than they might have thought. He's probably a certain horse that will probably be campaigned, I would say, softly, softly this year with an eye at chasing next year. But Beckett Rock definitely won for the trackers. <laughs> We'll move on, though, to the good stuff, which is Friday's action. Friday's card, we have the declarations for perhaps a small bit underwhelming, if we're probably being honest with ourselves, but a few decent races to get stuck into. Starting off with the two-mile handicap chase, I thought this was actually one of the better races on the card, Jake. Who did you fancy? Yeah, it definitely is in terms of numbers and uh, some interesting uh, horses turning up. Like, I do think it's a difficult race, to be honest. Um there's, there's one that I quite like, and that's Triple Trade, but it, it, it's not like a, a very strong selection on the card um, or across the weekend anyway. Um, but I do think he's interesting, obviously, off the back of his second at the October meeting where he was second by Dancing on My Own, who's rated 153, probably going to go to the Schler on Sunday. Um, and the, the thing that he really needs to improve on this time around is jumping the third last that day. He, he was in just about last place, like second last place, which... He cannot get behind like that and, and, and win a race like this. Um, the soft ground here is going to help him. He'll, he should be able to travel through the race a lot better. And yeah, I'm just really hoping that um, this time around, Brandon Powell can just be a bit more aggressive. I know Joe Tizard has said similar comments about how now they know he's up to this grade, they're going to ride him a bit more aggressive and put him into the race a bit quicker. Um, so hopefully that the softer ground will help him travel through the race better. And I, I think he's got a good chance off a mark of 130. But as I said, it's not my strongest opinion of the whole weekend. Yeah, I can understand that. I can get that. Dan, what about yourself? It seemed that two-mile handicap chase, I think we'll look back at that from the October meeting and say that's a pretty strong piece of form. What would you think? Uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure. I mean, they tend to work out well. I think they tend to be decent pointers when people look at the Grand Annual because course form is so valuable. But I, I think this race is actually quite trappy. I mean, you've got a few in here that I'd say are relatively exposed to what they've done. Uh, so the likes of Calico, for example, has obviously been flattered by John Bon. Uh, see, he's opened up favour. I wouldn't necessarily be sure about him at a relatively short price. Uh, so again, as has kind of been the way, if I'm unsure on a race, I've tended to go with a flyer in recent weeks. They've actually been working out fairly well. Uh, and the one on this occasion is Coast Guard Station. I think it's 18 to 1 currently, which I, I think if you really look at it, it's really, really big. I think Bally Breeze is a horse I like and probably will have a saver on him. But I mean, Coast Guard Station had a really good novice campaign last season, kind of keeping it on the low. One of these chase debut easily, kept good company thereafter. Uh, he finished second on his next start, three lengths behind Haddix de Zobo. So he's only two pounds higher for that run. Haddix de Zobo is now 20 pounds higher. That's all right, Gino was back in fourth. So that was actually a really decent race. He placed in a decent handicap at air as well off a two pound higher mark. He's interesting, he had a prep run over hurdles. So I think this race has been the plan. He often improves immensely for his first run. He actually ran pretty well over hurdles last time out and still relatively unexposed as a chaser. Henry Oliver won this with a very similar type in 2015, a horse called Keel Hall. So it's been a, a trodden path for him in the past. I say I think he's more unexposed than a lot of these, and he's a strong tra travelling type in a race. So I think there's a fair few pace angles. So if you can come into the race uh, from off the pace, I, I think a, mark, a, a rate price of 18 to 1 looks uh, pretty big. Um, actually quite keen on his chances. Yeah, well, I can see that completely. I, I think I probably landed on the one you're going to have a saver on, this Bally Breeze. I think he's just a pretty well-handicapped horse of 120. A horse I quite like in general is a horse called No Risk Day Flow, but I, I just think I'll be looking back from the castle for Chase of Weatherby with him, to be honest, or a big pot at Weatherby down the line. Uh, and I think this will probably be a bit of a pike opener. He's usually useless on his seasonal reappearance. Uh, something to bear in mind, considering he is a, probably a pretty short price for what he is. Bally Breeze would be for me. He's getting a bit short, though. I don't. I think the wise guys have already mm. probably clocked that he's a pretty well handicapped horse. He was more eight to one. He's now drifting, or no, contracting into more of a five to one, 11 to two, which is slightly less appealing, I must confess. Moving on to the Arkle trial. Now, 
I don't know whether you guys call a spade a spade on this podcast, but this Oracle trial is absolutely hopeless. Um, it's four <laughs> runners. Mighty Tom is second favourite, who was an absolute mule of a thing for Tom Cooper over hurdles a year and a bit ago. Somehow has transpired to be second favourite for grade two. JPR one's the favourite, Jake. He's like, he probably deserves to be favourite, and I probably think he wins, to be honest. Yeah, I'm in agreement. Um, I was actually at Newton Abbott when he made his chase debut. Um, and obviously that was a decent race. It was contested by Iseo and Monviel. Uh, obviously Monviel's a horse I quite like. Iseo didn't really run his race that day, but it's still quite highly rated. And yeah, with, with, with that race, it's definitely, um, he, he was the biggest horse in the in the paddock. And of, although he went off the biggest price, he jumped really well, traveled really well from third position. Um, and then really did wing his fences to be honest um and around in the home bend he traveled up really strongly and took the lead and wasn't for catching up the home straight so yeah if he puts in a similar performance like that then he's <clears throat> he's gonna take all the beating <clears throat> and um connections also had El Dorado Allen take the exact same route as well so uh he won at Newton Abbott before winning this race so yeah JPL won definitely for me and Dan yourself uh as I say now it's not one of the all-time great grade twos we're looking at here and no, it's instead of Arkle trial, it's who may finish sixth in an Arkle if the Arkle's a seven runner affair uh, <laughs> trial. I'd say it's it's not a race we're probably going to look back on with too many fond memories. I mean, Petit on air is interesting on Chase debut. I mean, it shows the standard that he's just happy to rock up here on on Chase debut. I mean, I mean, he might be a handicapper in time. JPR but one is probably, as you say, the most likely winner. I think he's always been a horse of a lot of ability. He's just been a bit of a fragmented last year or so. Obviously made a belated comeback after running in the Supreme a couple of years ago. One on his uh, last first time, last time out in uh, last season. And then Aintree, the, that race was just a bit of a mess. The pace was so strong and he was up there with that. So you can put a line through that. A lot to like about his chase debut, but it's a sad state of affairs when a horse rate 134 can pitch up in a grade two and be quite solid favourite. So... Yeah, not a race I'll be having a two, a massive swing on uh, from a punting perspective. And hopefully one of these actually just puts in a decent level performance and it, we can look somewhat excited for him moving forward. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair point. As I say, I think JPR won probably the most likely winner. Moving on to the high novice Sirdle. We've got a really good horse in this. I think the favourite in Captain Teague was excellent in the Persian War, having been a good third at this track in the champion bumper, which is very unlike, obviously, Paul Nichols' horses. Dan, I'll come back to you. First of all, your thoughts on him after the Persian War? And second of all, is this, I wouldn't say it's a penalty kick, but it, it's probably a pretty decent stepping stone onto potentially a shallow hurdle? Yeah, I think it, it was a good start in the Persian War. I don't think it blew anyone away. Uh, but again, you've seen Napa's Hill the other day was probably more disappointing than Captain Teague was, and we saw the leaps and bounds that he came on. At the weekend, I'd say maybe a similar case with Captain Teague here. I don't think he necessarily had to be anywhere near 100% to win that. I thought it was a pretty average enough race. I mean, the, the next two behind him may be reasonable enough handicappers, but I don't think they're going to set the world alight. I think Resplendent Grey is actually in one of the later races on the weekend. I think he, he really has to win this and win it reasonably well if we're talking about the horse we think we are. And if he's going to be one of the leading British novice hurdlers who have, has a chance at taking on the decent Irish horses... Obviously, the big doyen is kind of in the mould of Tagman in October in that he sets a standard. But if that standard is good enough to win, you'd be disappointed. Kimbara is interesting. Obviously, you'll know more about him than me being John McConnell's number one fan. But it'd be really disappointing if Captain T can't win this. It's a no-bet race for me because it's just not my kind of punting race. But hopefully he wins and wins well. Yeah, Jake, I know me and you were talking about Kimbara a little bit uh, before we came on. Would John McConnell's form at the moment cause a small bit of concern being a while since he's had a winner? Yeah, certainly not ideal, is it? Um, the one thing I would say is I don't think he's run anything of Kimbara's quality other than Marla Mission, who finished second in the Colin Parker Memorial the other weekend. So <laughs> it's not ideal, um, but he, he has been running a lot on the flat as well. Like He seems to have about five runners every week at Dundalk. So, yeah, I, I don't really know what to think of his table form but hopefully on friday he can he's got intense approach isn't he down at wexford and, and things like that so hopefully he can get some good runners and, and kimbara would be the one that for me that would be the most dangerous to captain teague but that being said i, I think captain teague is going to take all the beating yet again just like he did at chepstow and 
yeah, I was hoping this race would be a, a lot bigger test for him, but it hasn't really transpired that way, has it? Um, as I said, I think Kimbara, if he was eight to one, like he was anti post, I would have played him each way, but uh, five to one, I'm happy to leave the race alone. Yeah, I can see that. It, it just reminds me a little bit, I don't know about you guys, but a bit like the Hermes Allen, you know, race in this last year, where is Captain Teague not going to be made plenty of use of? And we're kind of forming an orderly queue in behind. I like Kim Barra. Mm. I, I just struggle to see how he has the gears to, to lie up with a captain G. Well, I think Hermes Allen last year, I mean, we still didn't really know because he came out with just won that two mile six race at Stratford, didn't he? Uh, so yeah. it, no, people weren't really sure if he was any use uh, and the stable didn't really seem to be very keen on him. Whereas on this occasion, they've been talking about Captain Teague in such like glowing terms. I mean, in comparison, if he wasn't to get the job done here, like I think they'd be left scratching their heads a bit. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Jake, there's a few other kind of big handicaps on the first day. There's a conditional jocks race, there's a cross-country race. Anything else that, that is looking to you, especially now that we have the decks, like a, like a betting proposition? Yeah, I mean, I had one lined up for the conditional jockeys race, but it got balloted out, which is a bit annoying. Um, but in the same race, Uncle Bert obviously will take a bit of beating, I think. Uh, he's got a £10 claimer on, obviously ran well in the Silver Trophy. Like yeah, I, th I think Nigel Twist and David John Cheltenham, you know what you're going to get, don't you? He's going to he's going to go off and he, he's going to have a good chance. Um, but obviously with, with such a big field, it's hard to be too confident. Uh, but yeah, no. Other than that, um, on Friday, I think it's a bit of a quiet day really, other than the main races, to be honest. And Dan, just a quick line on the cross country race. Obviously, Delta Work and Galvin both in there. Uh, both mm -hmm. will be probably pretty short when it comes to March time for this race. I wouldn't have been in a mad rush to be back in either of them at this time of the year, carrying that sort type of weight around. No, it's we know it's not their ultimate aim. It's just more of a case of if their class just gets them through. We know ultimately it's going to be back on the lashes, absolute main target. But again, the, the market doesn't really miss them anymore. They know who's being plotted out for these races, obviously pulled up last time out, but they just know that this is his absolute number one aim. And so he's, they've made him like the most standard each way price you can possible is what six to one five to one basically everywhere not a race that really infuses me from a punting perspective you'll probably know which elliot horse is more geared up just based on the market i mean it wouldn't surprise me if in come march galvin is able to overturn delta work just based on the fact that in come march it was galvin's first attempt uh, and i thought he ran very admirably well but yeah not a race that really infuses me but i was very glad to hear jake's case for uncle bert who was my other uh, fancy on this card actually I was really keen on him I think like Jake said I think that silver trophy he looked back at it I think he was just given an overly aggressive ride on that occasion like nothing else that really stayed with him was anywhere near at the finish so I think it was quite a glowing endorsement of them he was able to stay around for as long as he did like making all over hurdles at Chepstow is very very difficult to do the fact that he went off 11-4 favorite for that race and was pretty well touted for it would suggest they think a fair bit of him James Turner's last two rides uh, for Nigel in these conditional jockeys races he's won both of them so I think he's good value for that 10 pounds in these kind of races and I say this is a much easier contest than the silver trophy was so I think he's got a, a really outstanding chance as well good to hear I've, I've won more in the concluding race i remember the concluding race of this card last year uh, <laughs> a horse called explosive boy for tony martin got beaten ahead i backed it at i think 12 to 1 in the morning and then backed it again at 25 to 1 near the off and it got beaten a short head with peter john carberry on and i was I had my head in my hands on the Cheltenham steps. And Jake, as a great friend that he is, just decided this was a very hilarious time to take photos of me. Um, so therefore, I, I don't have great memories of this, but I'm looking for redemption. And I think redemption could be there in the case of Belgo Prince. I knew I think you say this. When, when you look, though, he's an impressive... Uh, he's another horse. He's another Tony Martin horse. The last time I remember backing him was at Leopardstown on Stevens Day, I think two and a half years ago, and he got beaten a nose at 25 to 1. I think it's a, I have a curse, <laughs> I have a complete curse, but he's a very well handicapped horse over her, based off his, off his flat form. I think he's up to a mark of 80 now on the flat. He's off 108. Liam McKenna takes five pounds off him. Only thing is I wouldn't want it to turn into a swamp. Uh, I think he wants not good ground, but he wouldn't mind it a little bit nicer then uh, obviously heavy or anything like that. So that's the one caveat I'd have, but I think Belgo Prince has a massive chance in the last race. So we now move on to the Saturday. Now, the Saturday is obviously the feature day, the Paddy Power Gold Cup day. We'll get on to that, but it's usually an excellent day in the racing calendar, I think. It just has that lovely piece of 
plenty of atmosphere, but you can still get around Cheltenham brilliantly. And Jake, we all know that this year's Saturday is going to be better than a lot of years' Saturdays for one reason, and it comes in the mayor's bumper. I don't know how we've done it, but we've wangled a runner at the November meeting. Yeah, it's magic, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, Sharp Object is the mayor in question. Um, she's owned by Syndicate Racing, and myself and Andrew have a share in her, so we're, we're lucky owners for the day. And uh, yeah, so she's been running in, in the bumper, which is the last race on the card. Uh, her form couldn't be working out much better. She won it on debut at Ballon Road. The second has won since. She then split the Willie Mullins pair um, in a listed bumper at Goran the other day. Aurora Vega was the winner, and uh, Abby's champ was back in third. And she's obviously gone on and bolted up and made in hurdle since as well. So the form's looking good. Hopefully, Sharp Object will be in good form. She's been trained for the meeting, and yeah, fingers crossed. It look it looks like a a race that we've got a favourite chance in, or, or or you know at least at the head of the market. So fingers crossed. And tell me honestly now, have you been like myself where you've been practicing? I've been practicing my lead in and celebration for this one. <laughs> like where I'm there pretending like I've got the, the lead rope in one and I'm <laughs> there with the other one. And I know that Dan's going to be standing in the front row with his head in his hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I order back the runner up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, somehow my some of my closest friends have had a winner at Cheltenham and I'm still in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> Your horse was withdrawn at the start, lame by the net. <laughs> oh no, yeah, no that, but... I tell you what, is that's gonna be really exciting because it's one thing having a runner at Cheltenham, like a lot of people aspire their whole lives to have a runner at Cheltenham, but I have a really good chance. I mean I've had a little skim through the race, like, yeah, you say Jake, she's got a, a, a leading chance on all form we know, so if she wins, yeah. that's going to be a hell of a night for us. Well, for you. Oh, I'll, you'll I'll, never I'll hear the end on. of it. <laughs> yeah, it, it. It will be a complete never hear the end of the job, I think. Uh, we're just very much hoping. I think there's a couple of um, the, the Irish train mares that are slightly double booked with the listed mares bumper at Navin on Sunday. And I think we yeah. need to be telling Willie, you know, come on, Willie, you know, Navin's such a great track. You know, you've got to <laughs> run your best mares there. So that's the hope. Anyway, fingers crossed she runs well. We're all hoping for the best. Moving on to the Paddy Power itself, the feature race. I think there's a pretty good renewal of the race, Dan, to be honest. A few nice, you know, you've got two grade one novice chase winners from the festival. That doesn't rarely happen in this type of a race. And justifiably, I know I know they're carrying kind of top weight and second top weight, but they're justifiably top two in the market. Yeah, so that definitely doesn't happen very often. I mean, you can maybe crab exactly the strength of, of, of particularly stage stars win at Cheltenham last year, but to have two of the novice chase winners line up is, is interesting. And it's also interesting given they're both front runners. Like from a tactical perspective, I think the market's shifted slightly now, but you had Stage Star, the real whacker, and not long till May, the top three, and they're all front running types. So immediately that poses a lot of questions. Then you add Torn and Freyd in there, who made all to win a, a Cheltenham handicap as well. So you've got a lot of pace angles. It's a really interesting race. Like I, I think it should work out pretty well. I really did struggle. I kind of went back and forth because you can really make a viable case for a lot of them. And it's it may well actually come down to on the front end, as we know there is a bias as to who gets into the best rhythm. Uh, but obviously that is a variable which you're not really known about. There's so many things that can go wrong or right there, regardless of your selection. So the one I started to warm to, and it's not the strongest selection in the world by any means, because I think it's a really good race, but it is Angel's Breath. I think just Sam Thomas is... I just have a feeling this is going to be in the aim for him. We know he's an absolutely superb target trainer and obviously it does come with risk because he's obviously a fragile horse but if he's anywhere near the ability he showed as a younger horse a mark 144 is ripe to be exploited obviously came back to form over hurdles in october i thought ran really well he was so weak on the exchange before the off there he'd been very well tipped up in the day on the evening before got really short and then drifted really alarmingly before the off, which kind of would imply that today wasn't the day. Still shaped really well carrying 12 stone. The other five of the top six that day were all race fit and they're all in form. So I think it's reasonably reasonable to assume that that's a decent level of form that he showed given he wasn't going to be fully geared up for that. The past seven winners of this race all had a prep run and that does count against a few of the those at the head of the market as well. I think he's going to be the type he will just travel into this strongly if he gets his jumping together, which there's no reason to think he shouldn't. It's just a case of what he's going to find in the finish. But he should travel into it well, and I think he's got a, a very good each-way chance. Yeah, strong case to be made, definitely. Jake, what about yourself? 
yeah, I mean, it'd be a surprise to absolutely nobody that I really like Unexpected Party here. Um, obviously, he was my horse that I put up in the Handicappers to Follow series. Um, and this is the exact race that I had in mind for him. So, you know, we managed to get here. That's, that's the first hurdle we'll overcome. Mm-hmm. Now we're going to see if we can try and win it. Um, look, I, I thought that he was very impressive in his Chapstick performance. I know, obviously, he was much more geared up for that than Nappers Hill was. But he still had to put in a good performance to win it. He did so. Napa's Hill has obviously gone on and boosted that form no end by winning the the, the, uh, the Rising Stars last weekend. Um, so yeah, the, in terms of recent form, that looks good. If you then roll back to the to the Cheltenham Festival in March, where he ran in the Turners and and he really was just ridden to try and place. Like he was never put into the race at all. Um, and this time around, he's going to be nine pounds better off with Stage Star and three uh, six pounds better off with Not Long Till May. So. Considering he'll actually be put into the race this time, he's been trained for the meeting. He's, by all accounts, from down to Gelton, what has been saying in the media, he, you know, he's peak fitness here, ready to go. Um, and that, that actually does say quite a lot because nine of the horses in the, in this race are going to be coming in into it fresh, um, or nine of the 17 entered anyway, obviously, we're talking before Dex. But um, so, to, you know, having race fitness on side is going to be a big bonus here. And I think he, he can just track the pace um and to see what happens like he's but he's off the mark of 146 i think he's better handicapped to win a race like this in terms of recent trends than, a, than the, the likes of a um you know the, the top weights or stage star etc so i think he's waited to go well he's a second season chaser been targeted at the meeting there's a lot to like about him and and, and obviously he only has to carry 10 stone 12 as well so yeah unexpected fight for me and fingers crossed he can put in a big performance very bullish, very bullish. I like to see that. Yeah, type of race I found hard. I, I kind of liked everything, but didn't like everything at the same time. I probably came down slightly on the on the side of not long till May. Not in dissimilar ilk to the way you guys are saying in terms of prep run over two miles, gets a bit of weight off stage star, gets 10 pounds off the real whacker. And I would have thought, given the two mile prep run, that this has been the plan for Laura Morgan and Adam Wedge. I'd be lying to suggest I wouldn't mind somebody else other than Adam Wedge riding the horse, but beggars can't be true. <laughs> so that's, we'll end on that. Three-mile handicap hurdle. Uh, these two races that we're now going to cover, the three-mile handicap hurdle and the two-five handicap hurdle, are just always dog rough races to try and find the winner of. Dan, I'm looking to you for inspiration because I have none in this three-mile handicap hurdle. Yeah, I think you've put it pretty succinctly there. I mean, I've started calling it the failed chaser handicap hurdle because the last three winners all reverted from chasing. Uh, but then I looked through all of the ones who were coming back from chasing. There was about nine of them. So I thought I'd narrowed it down. You really, <laughs> really <laughs> narrowed it down. <laughs> yeah, literally, I couldn't I believe it. I, was like, I, just, I couldn't quite believe what was happening. But I mean, Shamblu obviously sprung up think, straight away, but I just, I mean, he just hasn't been the same horse and I'm not really sure this is going to revive him they don't really seem too optimistic that it's more in hope i guess the one i was most interested in and the first one who sprung out at the deck at the entry stage was chantry house but again he has so many questions to ask but there's no horse in here with the class that he has shown previously like it isn't um that long ago that he was showing top level form that none of these in here would ever dream of Obviously, he's only had three starts over hurdles one two of them third and supreme they have talked about this being a plan and reverting to hurdles after a difficult fall last time out where he had a bit of a neck injury afterwards. Uh, so that's why he missed the rest of the season as well. So I don't think this is kind of a prep run for anything. I think they're just kind of getting him back on track and he's got a mark that's there to be exploited. I think Nicky's have generally been in pretty good form at the start of this season as well when he's won every completed start when he's fresh. So there's a lot to like about him. He's a reasonable enough price. If he does run, I will have probably a small win only bet, not massively confident. I will just have a word on place net as well who has been mentioned in a few places. Now, we spoke, me and Jake actually individually messaged our <laughs> French expert, uh, Adam, Adam Mills, who's, who's written for the us in the past about French horses. To put it bluntly, he says he's a bit of a summer horse who gets found out when the real winter types come out and that he doesn't look especially well handicapped on what he's actually achieved. So when he says something like that, I take note and I'll be avoiding him, especially at the short prices. But as you say, Andrew, nightmare of a race. Yeah, Jake, look, try to maybe even put these two races together, the three mile and the two five, because they're both uh, fiendishly difficult to, to solve. I know last year we had the luxury of having a rick like unanswered in the two mile five race. <laughs> and we could all actually back. Even Peter John was able to win on him. So he must yeah. add bags in hand. I don't really see any horse 
like that in this, especially when you see like the five for the two five races is imposed Twa, who's running in the last race on Friday. So he won't be running. Yeah, as you say, we can bundle them together because my horse is actually double entered. So I don't know exactly which race he's going to go for. I'd, I'd probably say that the two mile five races are is marginally favourite at this stage, just because obviously we've got a bit of rain forecast and a bit more rain over the weekend as well. So I'd probably go towards more of the two five race. But the horse in question that I really, I think is well handicapped and it is actually quite a well treated horse is Black Bamboo. Now, as I said, I don't know which race he runs in, but <clears throat> he's a, he's a horse who's been he was actually sent off 13 to 2 for the listed bumper on this card last year, uh, where he finished eighth, ran okay, w w wasn't anything special. Uh, but he's since gone over hurdles and, and he stepped up and tripped to two and a half miles and he's done really well. Uh, so he's second on his debut uh, when he was second to the last Mardi, who's rated 125. Uh, he then went to Galway for a maiden hurdle and he was third behind Tagman, um, sorry, behind High Class Hero, who's gone on to win that listed race the other day. And then Tagman was in second and he was rated 135 in, in the UK when he came over last month. So that looks like a decent piece of form. Um, and then after that, he was sent off nine to four, second favourite for a two mile seven furl on Killarney Novice Hurdle. Again, finished fifth, only beaten six lengths though. And, and whilst that doesn't sound great, um, it was actually a really good race. Lucid Dream Bonnet, he's now a 140 chaser. Tagman was second. Stu Sakini, um, who won the other day, was now rated 135, was in third. And then just a nose ahead of him that day was Solitary Man, who obviously won the listed race last weekend. He's rated 135 now as well. So if you put all that form together, he starts to look quite, quite well treated. He had a break um, after that of 51 days, came back last month, absolutely bolted up in a in a maiden hurdle over two and a half miles at Cork. Um, so he's been, he's probably been prepped for this meeting, to be honest. I, I'd imagine that was the, the prep run for this. He's been given a mark of 128 in the UK. And I just think that he he really can exploit that this weekend. And as I said, I'm just waiting to see which race he ends up turning up in. Probably the two and a half race. But yeah, I, I really like him. I think he's a good horse and I, I think he'll have a good chance this weekend. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Although I want to show complete transparency uh, while I'm making my one and potentially only appearance on this podcast that you texted me this horse, Jake, Black Bamboo, <laughs> at 1.09 a.m. Last, <laughs> last evening. Now, I don't know what you get up to, Jake, but why are you looking at the two mile five handicap for <laughs> 1 a.m.? Well, usually at that stage, I just send you guys random texts like I am the king or something to me <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. You're actually giving me informed opinions at, a, at that hour. Yeah, I was burning the midnight oil trying to find some winners in, in these two and a half mile, three mile handicap hurdles because they're just so impossible, aren't they? So, yeah, I, I was up for a while trying to go for every single horse. And when I stumbled across that decent bits of form, I thought, you know what, he's actually got a good chance and he's been prepped for the race. So, yeah, why not? 12 to 1 as well. So it's a decent price. Yeah, well, similar to the midnight tipper, all good things happen at that time of the day. <laughs> Dan... Anything else on the Saturday card? There's an amateur jocks race. There's a, a decent mm -hmm. enough standard juvenile hurdle as well to start the card. Yeah, I'd be very keen on Melantino in that juvenile hurdle, I think, especially if he isn't favourite because Burdett Road's been hyped up quite a lot and he's actually short for the triumph. Melantino has the best form in this race behind Jigmay. He should be favourite. If he isn't, I'll be very happy about that. And it isn't uncommon for horses coming over the France on their first run to win this. Uh, Apple Shakira did it previously. In the amateur jockeys race, Obviously, declaration still not known yet, but I thought first Lord de Coué had a good chance. So race has been kind to David Pipe in the past. What a moment, won it in back-to-back -back years. Swing Bill also won it in back-to-back -back years. So he's he's had a good record here. He's handicapped to win a race. He was second to Montbeg Genius off 127. He was second to Complete Unknown on his chase debut. So plenty of decent form there. I think he was getting seven pounds from Complete Unknown, but would now get 24 pounds. Uh, so there's a, a fair bit to like about that. Only disappointing run was at the end of the season, but he's had a wind up since. Uh, I think that's generally a decent sign for David Pipe's runners. I think there's a bit more improvement to come from him, and he's a very consistent horse. And in the listed novice chase, uh, I'm a big fan of Broadway Boy. I've kind of been having him as my Ultima maybe horse. I don't think necessarily winning this would put him off, maybe going down that route, but very likable type. We'll go from the front. I think they've been a bit surprised by him, hence why Sam chose to ride. We've all been caught last time out instead, but I think Broadway Boy is a horse going the right way. He's going to be ridden handily. I'd be very keen on his chances. And Holstone, who won this for the yard a few years ago, ran in the same October race and finished second uh, before winning this. So it's a well-trodden path, and he's a horse I like a lot. 
Jake, what about yourself? Yeah, I'd absolutely echo the thoughts on Melantino. If, if he's second favourite or, you know, two to one above even, I'd be very, very keen on having a bet on him. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed that he gets missed. I don't think he will, but let's, let's hope. Um, the only other one, not really a tip, but one I'll be keeping an eye on in the 3.15 at Navin in the pocket could make his chase debut. Um, <clears throat> could be a hot race as well. Fassel Vegas in there, some nice types. So, yeah, I'll be definitely keeping a close eye on that race if, if they all get declared. So we'll move quickly on to the Sunday. Good cards again. And starting off with the staying handicapped chase over three mile, three and a half furlongs. A proper, proper race, this, Jake. Uh, who are we getting stuck into uh, in, in a big staying handicap? Well, I don't know if he goes. Obviously, we're, we're talking before Dex. But if he does, I will be all over Guatapan Colange. Um, another horse that I've got up in my, my handicap is the Polo series. Um, yeah, I just really like him. I think that he really did need the run the, the first time out at Carlisle last month. Um, obviously, he ended up going and winning the race. Um, went up £7 for it, which is, you know, harsh enough. But I think there's a lot more to come from him. Um, yeah, I think I think he would have a great chance for Charlie Longson here if he if he actually does turn up. I think he's around nine to two. Um, I'll be waiting to, to see if he's declared because there is also a race at Haydock next weekend, which I did mention for him as well. So I don't know if he could go for that, but yeah, if he got, if he turns up, then quite a bank launch will be for me. Yeah, definitely a big improver. Dan, a horse in this that I actually didn't think had a, had a bad chance was Wayfinder, and I remember greatly that you backed this horse win only. Um, the October meeting, even though I think he was 70s on the machine, something like that. Yep. Yeah, you got to be bold sometimes. Um, I, my only quote with him is that I think he, he's best fresh. So whether he's going to be quite up to I it mean, here, he I'm was not 20 so sure. to one to be in the front three or something like that on the exchange. You just you you've just neglected a 20 to one place. Yep. Uh, that kind of sums up my season. To be fair, so thanks for bringing that one back up i'm i'm just not in a good state and you're just taking advantage of my vulnerability i, I didn't need to remember that i even just skimmed past him because i didn't want to remember uh, but now i'm stood looking at his silks yet again and not happy about it but the the horse I actually quite like in here oh god it's cloudy glen so i do a little stat breakdown before these meetings to just see what kind of things to look for and the one i noticed which was really sticking out to me was venetia williams at this meeting in the last 10 years is naught from 33 she's had the most runners of any trainer uh, to not have a winner and yet i've somehow landed on one of her horses in a race uh, so that kind of shows you how much attention i paid in my own research i just think if you're going to catch him it's going to be fresh i think he's still on a winnable mark if you look at his record on seasonal reappearance, it reads 1-4-1-1-3, third last year in a decent race. Well, they actually said he had a, a bit of a setback before. So I think you can actually mark up that performance. Second in the Kim Muir, a mark of 142, is very much in his range. And this is kind of a race of real dour types that have been around the block often. So I, I think he'd have a good chance. He's 16-1 to 1 currently. Very good. Schler Chase, interesting one whether John Bond will run or not. Edward Stone probably will run. Nube Negra will definitely run if the ground is anyway okay. Jake, where do you stand on this, really? I think I wasn't really with Edward Stone last year. I think I've kind of almost come round from this year as being a, a bit of a forgotten horse. Yeah, fair enough. Um, look, I, I, I want John Bond to turn up here. I want to see him. And there's two brains of thought for me. I want to see him win to be a champion chase horse. And equally, my anti-post slips want him to lose so that he can go to the Ryanair. But <laughs> we, sh we shall see what happens. Um, he should really be beating these if he's going to be a champion chase horse. Yeah, Dan, look, if he if he repeats what he did at Sandown at the back end of the season, he'll take a lot of beating here, won't he? Yeah, he'll run, he'll win. Uh, no interest in backing anything else. Won't back him because he's too short. Yeah, just hope to see a good performance so we can actually build up the clash with El Fabiolo again. Like, I know it's probably yeah. quite one-sided, but... And I just pray to God, because every year we get maybe a potential clash of horses we're excited about. I just pray we actually see them race against each other this season, because that champion chase has often just cut up to a farce. So hopefully he wins this, keeps winning all the season, as does El Fabiolo, and we have a, a decent race uh, come the festival. Yeah, fingers crossed. That moves on to the Greatwood, which is the main race on the Sunday. And this is a quality Greatwood, I think. This is as good a Greatwood as we've seen in quite a while. Plenty of horses you can make a case for. Only a matter of time that the Willie Mullins Paul Byrne horse. Like, this happened this time last year. Actually, one of you guys will know, because I've completely forgotten the name of the horse. There was a horse backed into anti-post fab for this race last year that Emmett trained. 
And then he drifted on the day out around 12 to 1 and had to be pulled up after three hurdles. He was useless. It Thousand seemed tears. That's, that's it. the exact one. 18 He's, to 1 SP. He was, I think he was 4 to 1 two days prior. Yes. Uh, it just screams to me, Dan, like the bookies are just running scared of Paul Byrne. I understand Paul Byrne's a sharp man. But there's no way in hell this horse should be three to one. No, nope, and uh, exactly. But you just kind of look at him, say, "Fair enough," and move on, don't you? If you're looking for this from a betting perspective, like I, I don't know why you'd really be interested in backing him at four to one. Like, if the only way you'd know is if you had inside information, you know he's going to be backed on the day. Otherwise, you just leave it alone. This race is a bit of a. There's some of my favourites in here. Like, see, Nick of Ocker Glory did me a, a solid the other weekend. Look away. He's in a handicap finally. Um, but he's ten pounds higher than when he started the season. So, he'd have been some Rick off one twenty two in this. Yeah, it literally, he'd be off ten ten. He'd be, he wouldn't even have the issue of getting in. Uh, but they've, yeah, uh, pain. And then the other horse, oh, I banged on to both of you for far too long about. Who I was pretty convinced would be a graded novice chaser is Loda Sud, who's just been saved for this apparently, and he's probably where I'm going to go. Like I just thought all of last season, this is a horse who was showing a lot and just looked like he'd improved for a bit more time. He was traveling like a dream in some of these good two mile handicap hurdles. And I think you really have to take note when the skeletons just basically save one for this race. We've seen it with Northfield Harvey. We've seen it with West Cork. And I think while they could have gone chasing with him, it would have been like a novice handicap chase, one a reasonable enough pot and maybe in graded company. But here, I think they know they've got a, a very good horse on a good mark and they've got a very big pot to aim at. And that is a very dangerous combination with this connect these connections. So he's the way I'm going to go, and I'd be disappointed if he can't go very close here. Yeah, Jake, would be I stood by look away when Neil King did bring the game into disrepute by running him in the grade two. He is Neil King, and that's why he changed his surname. I'm staying with him here because I think he's actually overpriced given what he's done in in that race. He's a solid improver. I think 132 is still actually under where he'll end up being as a horse. What do you think? Yeah, I don't have a great record in the in the career, but I must confess. So it, it, when, I, when I saw exactly, yeah, but when, when I saw when I saw such a competitive heat, I was like, wow, it, it is really hard to to know where to start here. And and as such, I basically got two trains of thought depending on what the ground does. If it, if it stays soft, um, but I thought Iberico Lord would have a really good chance. He, he has unfortunately been backed from the 12s earlier this week into 7s, which is a bit annoying. I assume that is just because obviously there is a lot of rain around. Um, but his second to under control, I think, looks good. He's still off a mark of 126. I think that's exploitable. Uh, only carries 11 stone. Yeah, I think he would have a good chance if it's soft. If it did dry out, though, I wouldn't be going too far away from 7 barrows because I do think Lucia would be the one that I'd have to back off a mark of 136. Um, I know she got beat the other day, and that was obviously on ground that was softer than ideal. Um, as she travelled up, looking like she could go past Europe well, but obviously didn't end up doing so. However, if, if it is good to soft on the day, um, well, obviously that remains to be seen. I'll, I'll definitely be waiting until the day to have a bet. But if it is, then I think a mark of 136 could seriously underestimate her as well. Um, I know you could say that for a lot of horses in this race, but I do think that she would have a great chance if it was, as I said, decent ground. Um, like Dan said, Knickerbocker glory's in here, but I think our main angle with him was that he's fresh, you know, was good fresh. Um, and he also likes it probably even softer than it's going to be. So in a in a more competitive field up five pounds, probably wouldn't be going with him. But yeah, very good race, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it was great to wrap up the Sunday card. Obviously, a fantastic weekend ahead. Uh, Jake, Dan, and myself, actually, and Josh, if anyone does watch Let's Talk Racing as well, will all be there throughout the entirety of the weekend. So if you do see any of us, make sure to come up, say hello. I'm sure we'll be in pretty familiar spots. The Arkle Bar, Feathered Fish, all scream to me like places that we may be dabbling. Uh, Dan won't be able to talk to you because he'll be sick. Jake will be too busy back in winners and saying that he's done it and I'll be there with my head in my hands for some reason or another with my dad back in winners beside me. But thanks again, lads, for, for having me on to host. You'll be back in the more capable hands of Tom next week. Uh, but as I say, really enjoyed it. Make sure to hit that like button. Subscribe to The Jump Show. It's fantastic. Couldn't recommend it enough. And the big target, 100 likes for this video. Let's get that there and let's get backing a few winners at Jump. See you next